Church family, if you would take a seat. Go ahead and take your Bibles, open them up to Exodus chapter 17. Uh, but I want to brag on Ari for just a quick minute uh, because after next Sunday, assuming everything goes to plan, this is the last time Ari will lead us in here until she comes back in January from having the baby. Uh, and so let me tell you, as a worship leader, uh, just day in and day out is never easy. But doing it eight months pregnant is pretty impressive. And so, Ari, we just appreciate you just holding up all the way through this point. And church family, look, that's a reminder for you to be praying for her and Jay as they get ready for little Zoe to arrive and just as they kind of settle into life with two children uh, over these next few weeks. And so just be praying for them, uh, and we'll let you know more about ways that you can just love on them and share with them, whether it's meals or notes or those things as they go. But Ari, thank you guys so much and just appreciate you. I want you to take a look at Exodus chapter 17. Several weeks ago, we started a series on our core values together as a church, the values that we say make us who we are as a body of Christ here at Starville Community Church. And so we started out by talking about the value of disciple-making. And what we said is this, is that church is not about us. It is about God and His desire to bring people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And so we commit, therefore, our time, our talents, and our treasure to this endeavor. And what we said that first week was that in order for people to really understand what a life-changing relationship with Jesus is like, we must help them understand what it means to be his disciple, what it means to be a follower and a worshiper and a servant and a witness. Then the second week, we talked about the value of community. And what we said is simply this, is that our community of faith is not is centered on the gospel of Jesus. And that that gospel is the basis for how we are to proclaim him to the world around us. And so we committed at that point to cultivating a genuine love for one another, a spirit of unity even in disagreement, and an attitude of selflessness. And look, we, we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, if you were here, and we said that it's vital for us to do this because we need community, every single one of us. But not only do we need it, but the world around us, others need to see real community in us if they are going to see Jesus and come to know who he is and be able to follow him. Then last week, if you were here, Tyler walked us into Psalm 96, and we talked about the value of worship and that our gatherings must honor God rather than please people. And so we talked about the fact that we commit to pursuing substance over style and authenticity over attraction in our worship gatherings. And if you weren't here, what Tyler did is he basically went through and he showed us what real worship is. He reminded us who it is that we worship and he called us and challenged us in how we worship. And I loved it because at the end, he really challenged us that our response to a God who is great and is holy and sovereign should be a new response. It should be a new song, a response that's fresh in every single season of our lives. This week, we're talking about a value that's near to my heart because we're going to dig a little deeper on this idea of worship and how our response to God should look. And so we're going to dig a little deeper on the idea of service and ministry as our response to God. And so here's the value. You can find these on our website. Just as a reminder, these are the core values that existed here at Starfield Community Church before I arrived as pastor in January of 2017. They have guided the journey and the DNA of our church since our inception, and our goal is that they would continue to guide it. So here's the value, is that every believer, every believer is called and gifted to serve God. And if that's true, then we commit to helping people discover their unique gifts and use them both in the church and in the world. That's what we're going to be talking about today. So I want you to take a look at Exodus chapter 17. We are going to read beginning in verse 8 of Exodus chapter 17. This is what scripture says. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. And tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. 
while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is my banner, saying, A hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning, and God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, our prayer is that you might speak to us through it today. Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our spirits and our minds to understand it, and Lord, that you would shape us through it. God, I pray that in this moment you might edit anything into this message that you desire to be said, and God, you might edit out anything that you don't desire to be said. Lord, that you might be glorified and honored in every part of our time together today. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We've got to understand a little bit of background of this passage. Israel has come out of bondage in Egypt. They have crossed the Red Sea. They are walking through the the desert towards the promised land. And we're told that Amalek, the Amalekites, come out and begin attacking them at the rear of the camp. Now, the Amalekites were a nomadic people. They lived in the Negev Desert or the south land between Canaan and between Egypt. The Bible tells us that Amalek, their father the one who was kind of the main descendant that they all came from, was actually a grandson of Esau. Now, the reason that's important is because that means that there's literally no chance that this group of people didn't at least have an idea of what the promise of God was to Israel. If they really were the the grandchildren of Esau, then they would have known that Canaan was promised to the children of Jacob, which I think leads us to this connotation that just like their grandfather Esau, that the Amalekites may have carried a bitterness towards Israel, that they may have felt overlooked and unloved, just like Esau did, and that as a result, it built this animosity in their hearts towards Israel. In fact, I think think Scripture backs that up because Amalek becomes one of the most inveterate foes that Israel faces throughout its history together. The Amalekites join later on with the Canaanites and they attack Israel at Hermah in Numbers 14.45. In the book of Judges, they band with both the Moabites and the Midianites to wage war on Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, we're told that the Amalekites raided Ziklag when David was living there and they carried off all the women and children, including David's wives and children. And the final mention of them is in the book of Esther when Haman, the Agagite, who was an Amalekite, conspire to destroy the entire people of God, the entire people of Israel, and have them banished or executed. The Amalekites had a deep, deep hatred and bitterness towards Israel. But this is the first mention of them as a people. This is the first mention of them as a nation. And I think it's important that their first mention comes as Israel is coming out of slavery and that they are the very first people to attack Israel once they've left Egypt. And you have to understand that this wasn't just a normal attack. This wasn't just a territorial spat that was going on. There was a a mean-spiritedness to what was happening. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18, tell us a little more. This is what it says. This is Moses speaking. He says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you came out from Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary And cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you. And he did not fear God. What Moses is telling the people and reminding them is that Amalek came at the very rear of the camp. They attacked the slowest ones. They attacked the baggage and the possessions, the old, the sick, the young, the people who were lagging behind. That's who they harassed. And so in the midst of that... Israel finds itself facing the first real enemy that they have to take on as a nation together. The first real battle that they are going to have to fight. And in this short episode, I think we find a few practical truths about service and working together that I think are going to be really instructive for us. So I want you to look at verse 9 of Exodus 17. Because the first truth I I think that we find in this is that Moses is confident 
in the cause. Look at what verse 9 tells us. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now this is a pretty innocuous sentence and phrase when we read it, but I think the contrast to everything else in Exodus up to this point is important. Because up to this point, ever since the moment that they've left Egypt, Israel has not been confident at all in what was going on. I would even submit to you that Moses has not displayed an air of confidence up to this point. In fact, in Exodus 14, as Israel is at the edge of the Red Sea, what happens is that Moses, uh, Pharaoh's army is coming after them. And so the Israelites raise up and they start saying to Moses, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to die at the hands of Pharaoh? And so Moses goes to God and he cries out to God for help and he cries out and asks that God would do what he has promised to do. And so God answers, and you've heard the story if you've been around church at all. God parts the waters of the Red Sea, and Israel walks through on dry land. There's a huge celebration. Songs are sung, memorials made, altars built. You think at that point Israel would have confidence in God, but it's not true. Because in Exodus 15, they arrive at Mara in the desert, and there's no potable water for them to drink. And so again, the people rise up and they accuse God, why would you bring us out here? If you were just going to let us die from thirst in the desert. And so Moses again goes to God, cries out, asks for God to help and do what he's promised to do. And God tells Moses to throw a log into the water. And the water instantly becomes sweet. And then God leads them to an oasis of 12 springs, one for every tribe of the people. So surely after that point, right, Israel would get it that God was going to take care of them. And they would begin to believe and have confidence. But no, because in Exodus 16, they arrive at the wilderness of sin. And this time it's not water that they're lacking, it's food. Once again, they rise up and they accuse God. Why did you bring us out of here? Oh, that we were back in Egypt and slavery and the meat pots of our captors were in front of us. I don't even know what the word meat pots means, right? I grew up in Louisiana. We had meat pies. That's maybe the most unappetizing word you can read in the Bible, okay? But that's what they say, that the meat pots of Egypt were before us. So Moses goes again to God, cries out, for help and that God would do what it is that he's claimed to do. And God sends manna, he sends bread from heaven to feed them. So surely at this point, right, the people would have confidence in what God's doing until you get to Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. And Israel is at a place called Rephidim, where again, they have no water. And again, they rise up and accuse God of not caring, accuse God of bringing them out into the wilderness just to die of thirst there. And if you've heard the story, you know that Moses strikes the rock and water flows out of it. But now, in Exodus 17, verse 8, something has changed. Now, when this foe comes and attacks them, we don't see Moses having to rise up and ask God for help anymore. We don't see the people making any accusations anymore. Instead, what Moses does is that Moses just moves. He just leads. He says, this is what we're going to do, and the people do it. And I think it reveals a confidence that has set itself into Moses' heart at this point. Because I think by Exodus 17, verse 8, Moses had heard enough and Moses had seen enough that he got it, that he understood that when God spoke, that when God called, that when God promised, that he could count on it, that when God said he was going to do something, that he could stand on it, that he could have confidence in the cause that God had laid before him. And so I think the application for us is pretty easy. Church family, we need that same confidence. And not just in our leaders. I hope that I could stand up here every single day, every Sunday, every Wednesday, every day I talk with you one-on-one and that I could be confident in what I believe that God has called us to do and who God has called us to be as a church. But can I tell you, I hope you could have that confidence. And I, I look at so many of you. I think about so many of you who are maybe watching this online today and I wonder how many of us walk through our days and if we're honest with ourselves, we're really unsure. Does God really love us? Will he really do what he said he would do? Can I, can I count on being saved? 
does God really care about the things that I'm walking through right now? Will he bring the things that I am praying for and asking for in my lives? Will he free me from the illnesses or the addictions or the anxieties that I'm facing? Can God do what it is that he has said he will do? I think so many of us are struggling with that. And I think we need the same confidence that Moses found. That we can count on God. Because when we have that, it makes all the difference in the world. I wanted to read to you Proverbs 14, 26. This is what Solomon writes. He says this, that in the fear of the Lord, one has, you see this, strong confidence. And the result is this, and his children will have a refuge. When we fear God, when we respect him, when we trust him, when we take confidence in him, it is a refuge for us and our families. Jeremiah writing to the exiles in Babylon in Jeremiah 17, 7 says this. He says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. Paul writing from prison to the church at Philippi says this in Philippians 1, 6. He says, and I am sure of this. Doesn't matter if I'm in prison. Doesn't matter if things have gone well for me or not well for me. Doesn't matter if I ever get to see you again. I am sure of this, Paul says. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Look, God hasn't started a work in us, whether it's as individuals or whether it's as a church, to just leave us and abandon us on our own. Parents, can I look at you and say that God has not started a work in your children for you to look at them as teenagers and adults and not be sure that he can actually save them and finish that work in them? He can. He will. Couples, God hasn't started a work in your marriage for you to get to 18 months of this pandemic and be so stressed out and so strung out that you're not sure that you can do it anymore. Students, God hasn't led you here, called you into a degree and into a career to leave you on your own. He who has begun a good work in us will finish it to the end. And in every battle we face, we need to ask the question, do I have confidence in the God who has led me here? Or am I just questioning him? God, I can't trust in you, man. Why did you bring me to this place? Why haven't you provided this? Why haven't you done that? I think the first lesson we learn is that Moses had confidence in the cause that God had led him to. But what's interesting to me is that for this battle, as important as that confidence was, it is not enough. Look at verse 10 of Exodus 17. It says this, So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, I love that phrase. So Joshua did as Moses told him. It's simple, and yet I think it illustrates the heart of Joshua. That he was willing to go where Moses said go. That he was willing to do what Moses said needed to be done. That he was willing to fight the battles that Moses said they needed to fight. And I would tell you, I think when we look at Joshua's life, this is a repeating theme of who Joshua is. In the book of Numbers, in Numbers 14, the Israelites are at the edge of the promised land at a place called Kadesh Barnea. God has sent in 12 spies. Joshua is one of those. They've come back. Ten of the spies have conspired to lie to the people of Israel and to tell them that there are giants in the land and that they cannot possibly overtake it. While Caleb and Joshua are the only two that stand up and say, look, the land is beautiful. It's exactly what God promised, and he will give it to us. I think we see it when Joshua assumes command of the people of Israel. And God promises him that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And so Joshua, in chapter 3, gets to the Jordan. And I love this because God tells him to lead the people across and that he'll split the waters just like he did at the Red Sea. Can you imagine Joshua at that point? I have to think that some part of him thought, really? Like, you're going to do that miracle again? Are you sure? I'm not Moses. But yet Joshua obeys, and God does. Then in Joshua chapter 5, 
God commands him to do a mass circumcision of the people. Can I just tell you something? That's not a popular leadership decision, okay? I don't care where you're from or how you paint it. There's no one that's going to get elected on that platform, right, of circumcising every male in the nation. And we're laughing, but Joshua does it. He's in the infancy of his leadership, and he obeys the command. Then in Joshua chapter 6, they get to their first real test in the promised land to Jericho. And God says to him, hey, what I want you to do is to walk around the city. So many of you have heard this story, right? Not I want you to draw up these plans and these plans. I just want you to walk. I just want you to trust me. And Joshua obeys. The next chapter over after Israel has suffered their first defeat after Ai, God commands Joshua to purge sin from the camp. Again, not a popular leadership decision. We're all about victories, right? We're really not all about leaders who want to purge sin from our midst. And yet Joshua obeys. He obeys when he's looking at a territory he has to conquer and he needs every fighting man he can get. And yet when God tells him to purge the sin from the camp, he does it. And here's what I think it shows us. is It shows us a heart of obedience in Joshua. That he was willing to go out when Moses said to face Amalek and that the warriors with him were willing to obey as well. And without that, without the obedience of these men, there would not have even been a battle. There would have just been three guys on top of a hill saying, this is what we think we should do. And so what's the lesson for us? Well, I think the lesson for us is this, is that our success as a church is due not just to confident visionary leadership. But I think our success as a church is due even more to us being able to be obedient as a people of God. In other words, it's this. We need more faithful and obedient disciples than we do visionary pastors. Can I say that again in the world of YouTube and Facebook and where, man, we all love to watch three-minute clips of the pastors that are like the most famous? What we need is we need more obedient disciples then we need visionary pastors. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says this. He says that we are not allowed to frame regulations according to our own conceptions, but our direction is whatever he says, do it. That his servants, talking about God, shall serve him. His sheep follow his footsteps. His disciples obey their Lord. His soldiers fulfill their pleasure. And then I love this, the highest exploit of the Christian life is to obey Christ. Do you see that? I want to read that one more time. The highest exploit of the Christian life is to obey Christ. Church family, in week one, we talked about the fact that a disciple is a follower. And if that's true, we talked about the fact that to be a follower, we have to obey then what I want us to grab this morning is our obedience to God is one of our primary responses to him. I love that, the highest exploit. The greatest thing you can ever do as a follower of Jesus is to obey him. Have you thought about that? It's to obey him. Secondly, I think we need to frame Joshua's obedience in in perspective with another part of his life. In Exodus chapter 33, we find this part that tells us that Moses used to take the tent of meeting and he would set it up outside the camp. And anyone that wanted to seek the Lord would go outside the camp and they would go into the tent of meeting. Exodus 33 tells us that whenever Moses would go to the tent of meeting, that the pillar of cloud would come down, the very glory of God, and that the people would stand at their doorsteps as Moses went in because they wanted to see this happen. It was so amazing and that they would praise God and pray until Moses came out. But in Exodus 33, in the midst of that description, we find this verse in verse 11. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Do you see that? Joshua would not depart from the tent, which means that Joshua was in the tent with Moses. And so when Moses left, the cloud of glory would lift off. Everyone else would go back to what they're doing, except Joshua. Joshua wanted to be with the Lord as long as he could, as much as he 
could. And I think for us, what we need to understand is that Joshua's obedience was a natural outflow of his relationship with God. And what I mean by that is this, is that for us, our desire to obey God will never be greater than our desire to be with God. If you don't spend time with him, you will not obey him. You may try, but you'll fail. For some of us, can I just maybe suggest, some of us that are wrestling with things like alcoholism or pornography or substance abuse or other sins that are pernicious and ongoing in our lives, can I maybe just suggest this? That part of the reason we're struggling and we can't let them go is because we're doing everything else but spending time with Jesus. Joshua's obedience didn't, didn't happen in spite of his relationship with God. It happened because of it, because he was spending so much time with the Lord that he wanted to obey him. And I promise you that if we'll do the same, that we will find a deep desire to not only be with him, but to do what he has called us to do. In this episode, man, we see that Moses was confident in the calls of God and that Joshua was obedient to the calls. But victory also came for Israel because Aaron and her were supportive of the cause. Look at verse 11 and 12. It says, Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it, while Aaron and her held up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Now look, that phrase in verse 11, that Moses held up his hands, it describes the Hebrew posture of prayer. Moses wasn't going up on that hill to just raise up his hands. He was going up to that hill to pray that God would do what it was that he had promised to do. And all the verbs are in the perfect tense, which just simply mean that they connoted a ongoing perpetual action. That Moses had to continue in prayer, that he had to continue in that posture. Which is interesting to me that this is exactly the place that we see the only note of failure in the story. Do you see that? But Moses' hands grew weary. Look, the job of supporting the battle in prayer was not an easy job, all right? And Moses, I think what we see in this is he is not up to the task. Was it his job? Yeah, but he couldn't do it. It was more than he could handle. And what we see in this is that he needed others in order to get it done, which is why Aaron and Hur's response is so crucial. Do you see that in verse 12? So they took a stone and they placed it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Do you notice they don't bring shame to Moses because he couldn't hold up in prayer? They don't admonish him or accuse him. They support him. Do you see that image? They literally take a rock and put it under him, and they say, you sit, Moses, while we'll stand. You rest and we'll do the work of holding your hands up. That's an amazing image of support. And we need people like that in our lives, don't we? And we need to be people like that for others. I, I fought with this message a little bit this week because October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And I've gotten several notes from some of you that have meant the world to me. But I asked our staff this week if they knew that October was Pastor and Minister Appreciation Month. And they were all like, is that even real? <laughs> Can I tell you something? Like, that's kind of sad that we joke about that, isn't it? Can we just be honest? If it was Teacher Appreciation Week, we would all know, right? If it was Nurses Appreciation Week, we would all know. If it was... First Responder Appreciation Month, we would all know, would we not? And I think we should all know. But church family, can I ask you a question? When was the last time you came beside Truman or Tyler or Ari or Brian or Peyton or our nursery workers or our nursery coordinator, Beth, and just thank them? 
for what they do? When was the last time you wrote them a note telling them what it means that they have invested their lives in our church, in you, and in our city? We need people to come and lift up our hands because church family, this work that God has called us to, it's more than I can handle. I am not Superman. It's more than our staff can handle. It's more than our elders can handle. It's more than our leadership team can handle. And we need you. We need you to come alongside of us and to support the cause. We need you to give your time and your energy and your talents and your money and your passion and your heart to something that is bigger than all of us. It's extremely important, which I think is why Paul writes to the the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12, and he says this. He says, let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, and he says, hold fast to what is good, and then he describes what that means. He says, love one another with a brotherly affection. I love this. Outdo one another in showing honor and appreciation. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Don't just sit in a chair on Sunday mornings, but serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Not just the pastors, not just the leaders, but all of you. Be constant in prayer and contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Peter writes it this way to the churches in Asia in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. He goes on, he says this. He says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, because to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Peter says, look, whatever you've been given, whatever talent, whatever strength, everything you have been given, church family, everything you have been given has been given to you for the purpose so that God might be glorified in it and that you might serve the church that he gave his life for. The difference between the American church and our brothers and sisters across the world is that we are a selfish church and we make each other feel better about it. You go to Thailand, Mexico, Haiti, Nigeria, you go to France or Russia, you go to India, and there is an expectation that you give everything you have in any moment that a fellow believer has a need, that you show up, that you support. You go to Mexico, to the Yucatan Peninsula, you'll find churches meeting with corrugated iron roofs, the same ones that we use to decorate welcome centers in America, and they've started 10 other churches while they're just barely meeting out of a building that has walls. But the difference is in America, we build churches that cost $110 million, and we talk about how great it is. Everything we have, God has given to us so that we might bring glory and honor to him in Jesus Christ. And church family, here's the promise of scripture is this is not something that we will ever look back on and wish that we hadn't done. I want to read to you Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. Scripture tells us this, that whoever brings a blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. In other words, just because you sacrifice and give it up, God is going to bless you. That doesn't mean he's going to make you rich. It means that you'll never get to a moment in your life that you look back and think that you wasted your life in service to God or to his kingdom. I don't miss anything. I don't regret anything in the things that we have given up to follow God's calling on our lives. Even the really bad moments, man, they were worth it. Because whoever brings a blessing will themselves receive a blessing. I love this story in Exodus chapter 17 because I think it shows us a beautiful image of what true teamwork in the body of Christ really is. Without the leadership of Moses, the Israelites would have never made it as far as they did. Without the obedience and courage of Joshua, the people would have been overcome. Without the support of Aaron and Hur, 
neither Moses or Joshua would have been able to endure. If any of them had failed to do their part, the battle would have been lost. But because Moses was confident in the cause, because Joshua was obedient to the cause, because Aaron and her were supportive of the cause, the result was victory. Verse 13 tells us that so Joshua and the people overcame Amalek. And it was a victory not just for that moment, but one that they would pass down to all generations. Here's the lesson for us as a church. The lesson for us is this, is that in order for us to do and to be what God has called us to do and to be, it takes everyone. It takes everyone. The redwood trees of California are some of the largest trees in the world. In fact, the General Sherman tree in Sequoia National Park is the largest tree in the world. It stands at over 276 feet tall, which is taller than the 26-story building. It is more than 25 feet wide or wider than a city street. You could drive two cars through it at the same time. It weighs over 20 tons. And it's 2,500 years old. Now, most of us would think that something that big must have an incredibly deep root system, right? But I was surprised this week to learn that that's not true, that the roots of the giant sequoia go down only 6 to 10 feet on average. So how can something that big, that heavy, withstand storms and winds and floods and fires for that long? How is it possible if its roots don't go more than 10 feet deep? Well, the truth comes in the fact that giant sequoia intertwine their roots with the root system of all the trees that surround them. So that underneath these large, giant trees, there is an army of roots. There is an army standing, ready to support one another. In fact, The truth is that these trees literally hold each other up. Church family, what a picture for us as a church. What a picture of the value of support that God has intertwined us together that we might hold each other up. I love this image of Exodus chapter 17. I love the image of Moses' hands being held up. And church family, can I share with you that I look at this story and you know what I think about? I think about Jesus. I think about the one that allowed his hands to be held up for us. That gave everything for us. For my sin and for your sin. So that the shame and the guilt and the judgment that we earn for that sin, that we wouldn't have to face it. I think about the one that was willing to let his hands be held up so that I could hold mine up. And I think what an amazing picture of what it means. And I promise you that if you'll just accept him as your Lord and Savior, that there will never be a moment that you don't know the strength and the support that comes from intertwining your life with his. You'll never regret it. And so here's my question. For some of you in this room, for some of you watching this online, what are you waiting for? Do you really think inside that you can learn enough? That you can be good enough or smart enough or do enough? That you'll ever be able to stand on your own? What are you waiting for? 